enjoyed this time before our kids leave out. Uh, as you know, last week we revealed, uh, we had the, the great sock competition, and uh, we revealed the winning socks to you last week. And I told you th those were the pretty, pretty princess socks. If you didn't get to see it, all you have to do is go online, look back, and man, there they are for, for the world to see forever, I guess. But I promise you that I would wear uh, the rest of the socks, not all at one time, but I would, over the next few weeks I'd be uh, wearing them. So I'm going to reveal to you today the socks I'm wearing. And today I'm wearing the, uh, the caveman socks. Yeah. There you go. Got a lot of stuff. All right. I want to know, who created these socks? Are they here? Who? Pardon me? First service. All right. So I missed them. First service. They were here. All right. So anyway, uh, those are the socks I wore today, and they were pretty bright, and they're really losing a lot of stuff as I walk. So uh, I thought last week's were bad. These, these are really falling. And so I, I told them in the first service that if you see glitter coming behind me, man, that's just the presence of God working. Amen? <laughs> the Spirit is with me. But anyway, but thank you again. These are the socks I'm wearing. Next week I'll reveal another pair uh, for you, and uh, but I promised the kid, they make them, I'll wear them. So, uh, so th there, the, there you go, the caveman socks. So anyway, kindergarten, first and second graders, now you may go. And uh, y'all have a great time in our children's church. Miss Carrie is back there waiting on you. So uh, have a great time. Kindergarten, first and second graders may be dismissed to uh, children's church. So y'all have a great time, and we shall see you uh, at the end of our service today. Immerse is coming up. I, I shared with you last week about that, March 27th and 28th. Uh, we have out in the foyer some little uh, flyers that we want you to uh, be able to take and, and encourage and invite people to come to our Immerse Bible Conference. Uh, on Friday night, we'll start with a great worship service, great revival time. So we want to encourage you, even if you're not interested on Saturday morning coming to the breakouts, uh, which I think next week when we give you everything and let you see all of them, I think you're going to be interested because we've got some great breakout sessions uh, showing us how to immerse ourselves in the Spirit of God, man, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. But if, if that's not for you, then we, we still have bookends. We have on Friday night, we'll have a great time of revival worship, so we want you to come and then we'll have Saturday morning till 2 o'clock, we'll have the breakout sessions with lunch included. Uh, then on Saturday night, we'll have our dinner and our revival service at, uh, at 6.30, dinner at 5.30, revival at 6.30. So we want you to come and be a part of that, encourage people to come uh, to the conference. But uh, you, you can register if you're interested in that. You may go online and register. Or if you'll look in your bulletin, there is a, and they told me what it was called again in the first service, and I forgot. QR code. Thank you. There's an actual QR code, and that's pretty cool. I just learned about those. I just thought they were something they put on products just to make it look cool but I come to find out you can uh, use that on you with your phone and you can go to a website and if you'll click on that man it'll take you right to the registration form it's ten dollars for the Saturday conference uh, is all it is and that gives you a breakfast and uh, a lunch child care is free up to the sixth grade so you don't have to pay for your kids uh, but finally some you don't have to pay for them on amen you, you can just pay your ten bucks to get in per person and the kids are free but please be in prayer for us. I believe this is going to be an exciting time, but registration, you can begin today. You can register on your phone uh, online, or you can uh, pick up a form out in the lobby and fill that out, and uh, I think you're going to be really blessed with what God has put together uh, and helped my staff and I put together for this Bible conference. It's going to be a great time. Well, today we're going to continue with the idea of getting people to Jesus Getting people to Jesus, that's what God has called the church to do. That's our priority after worshiping him and after growing. As a matter of fact, he even says, and I'm going to preach on that in the next week or so, is about why we even do what we do, that we have teachers and preachers and, and all that to train so that they can carry on the ministry of reconciliation. So the church is to gather together to be encouraged to worship our God on Sundays, and then we're to train, to develop, so that we can go out and to reach people for Jesus. Today, my title is Remembering Who We Were. I believe this is going to be an important uh, time, and I believe it's important for all of us as Christians 
whether you're here in this service or you're watching on this live stream, then it, it's important that we, in order to get a strong desire to worship and a strong desire to reach people, that we need to remember where we were. So I want you to take your Bibles, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we're going to start reading. We're going to be reading starting at verse 9 through verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Again, remembering who we were, not who we are, remembering who we were. Let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's word this morning. Paul writes here, <clears throat> starting at verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covenants, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the many blessings you've given us, for the opportunity to gather here this morning to sing these praises and worship the songs to you, Father. And we, I pray that every person here, Father, felt your spirit. Those watching us felt the spirit where they are. And, and that, God, we, we know that you're here. We know that you're moving. We know that you're working. We know, God, that you're calling people. You're calling people to salvation. I believe, Father, you're calling us to the ministry of reconciliation. And, Father, I pray today that we would have a time of remembering Remembering where you brought us from and where we are now. God, I pray as I always do that today these words are not my words but yours. I pray that this is not even my message, Lord, but I pray it's your message. And God, I pray that the response would be as you desire for it to be. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, real quick, before I, I get into this, I, I want us to understand that when I read this, because this this sermon today is not a judgmental sermon. This is not with the idea of all of these things that, that we just read about. These sins by no means are listed to say that these are the only things that people do that are lost. But what they do is they show saved people's lives cannot be characterized by these things any longer. That if we are saved, this will not be who we are. So it's not saying because we realize that there are multitudes of sins. As a matter of fact, there's only one sin even that, that is necessary for us to be lost. And as a result, we will be eternally lost if we do not receive Jesus as our Savior. But the thought that I want us to have here this morning is this. We need to remember, in order to really get excited, and we've been now preaching this series of messages a couple of weeks, of bringing people to Jesus, we need to remember that everything about our salvation had nothing to do with how special we are or were. Our salvation has nothing to do with, with how special we are or were. Because I'm here, I'm here to tell you, my friend, I realize standing here today, there is nothing special about Harold Gacious. And it would have been fine if you had lifted up the roof to say Amen. I would not have been offended, amen? Because I'm about to, to shake your world. Because I'm about to tell you there's really nothing special about you. Amen? The Bible says we're sinners. So there's nothing special about us when it comes to salvation. I'm not saved because I was a good guy. I'm not saved because I'm a preacher. I'm not saved for any other reason except I received Jesus into my life. There is nothing special about the salvation as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing about our salvation that's special as you are concerned. We didn't do anything. We didn't pay the cost. We didn't die on the cross. It was Jesus that did it. And so we need to sometimes, here in the church, I think need to be reminded that we were once like that. In order for us to get excited about bringing people to Jesus, to get that true heart, we need to be remembering these things. 
And the thing that I want us to do is to remember, as Paul brings back to mind here, remember a couple things. The first one is, we have all been guilty of sin. Amen? All of us. There's not one of us here today that's not guilty of sin. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we were even born into sin. Not that we had to go out and sin. We were born into it. That's why, have you ever noticed how easy it is to sin? It's easy because we're good at it. We're not because it's that's who we are. That's who we were. That's how we were born. We were born into that state of sin. We were born into that mindset of sin. Man, I tell you all the time that we can even look at little kids and realize we don't have to teach little kids how to sin. Amen. Watch them. You're their parents. You know you didn't teach them some of that stuff. Hopefully not. If not, the, the nursery workers want to visit with you right after church. <laughs> Amen? Sinning comes natural, so we need to remember. In order for us to get it excited about bringing people to Jesus, we need to remember that we've all been guilty of sin. The Bible even tells us in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means all of us have it. And as a result, if we could... If we could just stop a minute and, and realize, hey, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. If we could do it, what that would allow us to do, it allows us to do a couple things. As a result of that, the first would be that we should feel empathy. Instead of getting judgmental about people who are lost, people whose lives are caught up into this sin, who are doing basically what natural lost people do, we should feel empathy toward those individuals now what is empathy empathy is viscerally feeling what someone else is feeling and i hear all the time preacher you don't know how i'm feeling you don't know you don't understand listen i don't know exactly what you're feeling but i can have empathy on people i can have empathy and i should have empathy on lost people because i know what they're going through because i was there i used to be lost amen I know what it's like not to have Jesus in my life. I know what it's like to be able to, uh, to realize that I'm rejecting God and not care about him. I know what that's like. So I can feel that. I remember the night that I was saved at Shelter First Baptist Church in 1981, my senior year of high school. I was 17 years old. I remember what it was like that night. And I want all the time to remember that. I want to keep in my mind what that's like so that when I see people caught up in the sin that I was caught up in, caught up in the life of lostness that I was caught up in, that I won't look at them and go, well, I would never have done that. We have been lost, amen? We should feel empathy. And as a result, I've warned you many, many times as pastor here, we should never look at anyone to say, well, I would never. If that were me, I would not have. May I tell you something? You probably did. One way or another, you probably did. Now listen. You say, well, I've never physically done No, Jesus has talked about sin, and he took it to such a degree that he even said that if I think about an act of sin and I dwell on it, even though I don't physically go do it, it's as good as what? Doing it. You did that. I've never murdered anyone, but boy, if I thought, boy, in my pit of anger, I felt like I wish someone would, was dead. I've murdered them. The Bible says if I look upon a woman and I lust in my heart, I basically cheated. If I thought about a lie in my mind, about a lie, lying about something, Jesus said, you've done it. So listen, we cannot ever look at somebody and go, well, if that had been me, I would have never, because chances are you did it. Maybe only in your mind, but you did it. Now, that's not my words. That's Jesus. That was, that's his level. Amen? That if he says, if you think it. So we can't say we would never, because again, chances are we probably have. We should feel empathy toward people. And as a result of feeling empathy toward them, we should then have compassion. Folks, the church, listen to me, the church ought to be a compassionate body. We should have compassion on people. We should have compassion 
for the, those who are lost. What is compassion? Compassion is being moved, working to alleviate a person's suffering. Do you realize that a lost person is suffering? Amen? They're suffering from the effects of their lostness, and they're, they're going to continue to suffer, and there is no hope of their suffering. But as a Christian who realizes I was once lost, who realizes that, that, that I feel for them because I remember what it was like being that way, that I should be moved with compassion, in other words, to do whatever I need to do to help bring them from that state of lostness into the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's compassion. You remember Jesus was looking, and the Bible says that when he looked out, he saw people as moving around as though they had, they had sheep with no shepherd, and he was moved with compassion. Do you know what he did as, he was, as a result of being moved with compassion? The Bible says he died on the cross. He was moved with such compassion for those who needed a Savior that he came from heaven and he came to this earth and he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross. That's how much movement to compassion he was. My friends, listen to me. We as a church need to be a compassionate people. Instead of standing here and stomping our foot and screaming about how, how bad the lost people are, we need to be having compassion for them because I remember what it was like being that way, that I then am moved to do whatever it takes to, do, to bring them to Jesus. That's why Paul here reminds them of what they were. And then as a result of this remembering that we've all fallen short, then we can understand that I want you to know this, that no person has sinned too long and no person is too deeply in sin that they cannot be saved. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. I don't care where they are in their life at this very moment. They are not so far away from God that he can't reach down and by, by his grace and by his mercy save them pull them out of that, and we, we as the church need to say, well, they're just too far gone now. There's certain people we can't reach. According to the Scripture, there's no one that God can't reach. As a matter of fact, he says this right here in, in Isaiah 59, 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Instead of looking at people saying, I think they're too far gone. I think they're in such a lifestyle that we'll never be able to reach them. I think what we ought to do is have compassion because we remember how we were lost. Look at them and say this. If God can save me, he can save anybody. Amen? You say, well, I'm not as bad as those people. <laughs> yeah, you were. He said, he said you were. Guess what? You were as lost as they are lost. Amen? You know, sometimes I hear people, and, 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 and I, I, I talk about hearing people's testimonies. And man, I, have, have you ever been intimidated by someone's testimony? Man, you hear how deep into sin they were, and man, they were boy, just into all sorts of stuff. And boy, they were at the bottom, of, and they, they were messed up, and life was crazy. They had no hope. And, and, and man, all of a sudden, God did a great work. And this person who was so far away from God, man, he gave us, or she gave her heart to Jesus. And now, boy, they've been brought up out of all that. And you go, woo, yeah, that's good. But I don't want to tell my testimony now. Because, man, my testimony is not near as powerful as theirs. Can I tell you? Listen to me. You were as lost as they were. Amen? I mean, how lost can you be? Because what did we determine last week lostness was? Being separated from God. So a person who has their life so deep in the muck and the mire, they're separated from God. A person who's trying to be a good moral person, living a life separated from God, guess what? You're still lost. And can I tell you this? This is something else that should blow your mind. Do you realize it took as much die of Jesus dying on the cross to save them as it did you? Guess what? He still had to die. So we can't sit and say 
They're too far gone. We ought to be able to look at people and say, listen, if there's hope for Harold Gacious that he could reach that 17-year-old boy in Shelter, Oklahoma, if he can reach him, I know he can reach them. Amen? Because that is remembering that I was once lost. I am no better than the most lost, lost person out there. Folks, none of you are better. We might think we're better. They're lucky to be around us, aren't they? They're lucky to be in my presence. No, they're not. Because you're nothing compared to Jesus. We're not better than anyone. We're just better off. Because I have Jesus in my heart. Jesus saved me. And my friend, listen to me. I know Harold Gacious. Y'all think you know him? Oh, I know him. And I'm here to tell you, if he can save me, he can save you. And he can save anybody. I remember. I remember. And we need, as a church, to remember. And then the second point, not only do we remember that we've been guilty of sin, but the second one is that I am saved by nothing of myself. I am saved by nothing of me. Because I, again, am no one special. I did not do any amazing feat. I did not pull myself up to amazing heights so that eventually I could be saved. My salvation had nothing to do with my works. It was by grace I have been saved through faith. That's it. Not of works. It is a gift of God. Lest we stand in here in the church and we begin to boast about how good we are. No. I need to be humbled before God and realize that I'm saved only because Jesus died for me. I'm only standing on this platform preaching this message only because God, somewhere in his infinite wisdom, decided this would be a good idea for me to be doing this. Because this wasn't my idea. Amen? You know my testimony. This wasn't what I went to school for. This wasn't what I worked years to do. Not this. But God in his wisdom. So I'm, there's nothing here. None of this is by myself. Because here's what Jesus said. You need to remember that you were, but you are now this. You were this, but you are now this. What did he tell us? Look down in in, in verse, verse 12, or verse 11, I'm sorry. And such were some of you, but, oh, here we go. We were all lost, but now we're washed. We're washed. Our sins have been forgiven. We are now a new, having new life. That old life is gone. It's, it's now that I'm new. I'm not that same guy that I used to be. Because I used to be those things. But now I'm not. Why? Because I've been washed. Given new life. The Bible tells us here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. These. Those have passed away. Behold, now everything is new. Those old things are gone. So I've been washed. My friends, you've been washed. That blood of Jesus has come and literally transformed who you are. That's why it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed conform means molded right don't be molded into the ideologies of this world be transformed you know what transformed means it doesn't mean to be molded doesn't change your shape transform means to change who you are amen you're a new person so we have been washed because of jesus and we need to understand it so not only have we been washed But he says then we were now sanctified. That's new holiness. That's living outwardly. 
I have been set aside, sanctified, being set apart. That now I am new, I'm set apart, I have a new life, I have a new outward image. Listen, my friends, we ought to, as Christians, to be living on the outside what Jesus did on the inside. Because it's what's on the inside that really matters. It's what's on the inside that's changed. So let him set us apart. Let us now be sanctified. Let us now be living a life that is pleasing to him in all of the things that I do. And I preached a few weeks ago. Whether we eat or drink or whatever it is we do, we do it to the glory of God. Because I've been sanctified. He said, you were once these, but now you're sanctified. But not only sanctified, boy, here's where it gets good. We are justified. Whew. We are justified before God. In other words, we now have been given, as Christians, a new position. Do you know what that position is? That position is, as I shared with you a couple weeks ago, that loss is being set out here. And that's where we're located, separated from God. But now we've been justified. We've been now switched places. Because Jesus came and, as the Bible says, took our sin. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Here's what happened. I'm out here. You were out here. We're lost. We're separated from God. I don't care how good you were. I don't care how bad you were. I don't care how much good you've done. I don't care how much bad you've done. You were separated from God with no hope whatsoever. Then God sent Jesus, who was righteous before God, who could be God, said there is no hope for them being separated from me. So now, Jesus, what you're going to do is you're going to go out there and you're going to become their sin. You're going to become Harold's sin. And Harold, you now are going to take on his righteousness. And because you take on his righteousness, now you get a new position. You get to be co-heirs of the kingdom of God. Folks, that ought to get you excited. We're co-heirs. I now have a new position. But it's not because of Harold Gacious. It's not because of me. I am not a, I'm not a righteous man by any means. Oh, but I am taking on Christ's righteousness. That changes my position. I am now, listen, I am now justified. Get this, I am now justified to stand in the presence of God. Come on. Where before I couldn't even mention his name. But now, I was once this, but now I am justified before the very presence of God. Wow. Folks, we need to remember that. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. So I need to remember that I am saved by nothing of myself, only because of the name, as it says here at the end of verse 11. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How am I done that? Through his death. Jesus Christ, in order to get me over here to God, to be, make me justified, to change my position, he had to die. But you know what? Whose death did he die? He did mine. He died yours. He didn't deserve to die. I and you, oh folks, listen to me. We deserve what we're getting. We deserve it, amen? Amen when I'm over here but then he traded places with me and he died my death that I deserved he took on my sin that I committed and he died for me in my place and in your place 
he died. But not only that, but through his burial, he was put in the grave that I deserve to be put in. Remember, we sing that song every now and then, that when he calls my name, I ran out of my what? Grave. I got out of that grave because that was there. That's where I was. I was dead in my sins, and I should be buried in that tomb. But when Jesus called my name and I received him as my Savior, I got out of that grave, and he got into it. He was buried in my tomb. By his death and his burial, praise God that he did that. And then, lastly, by the resurrection, by his resurrection, he was dead from dying on the cross, buried in that tomb. And on the third day, the Bible says that he was raised up to new life. He was alive again. My friend, listen to me. We serve a risen Savior, not a dead Savior. We serve a, a Savior who is back alive, not one who's dead. We serve a Savior who's out of that tomb, not buried in that tomb. We serve a Savior who's standing at the right hand of God, making intercession for us, not down here and, and living in this gray death bed of, 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 of just nothingness. That's what we have. And you know what? The Bible says because of his resurrection... And now I'm taking on his righteousness. Guess what? There's going to come a day that I'm going to be resurrected. I have the resurrecting power. Those who've gone on before us, the Bible says, that, that Paul says, I want you to mourn as people who have hope that someone who's gone on before you, you will have hope in them, knowing that those who have gone before us, that at the trumpet, of the, when God blows that trumpet, when Jesus says, come home, that the Bible says that those who are dead in Christ shall raise first. And then we which are alive and remain will likewise be caught up in the air. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus. I now and you now have available to you the resurrecting power. Mm. Remember that. Remember that. And it's all ours. But remember, folks. We weren't always like that. We didn't always have that. But because of us receiving Jesus into our lives, receiving the sacrifice that he gave, now I have been washed, I've been sanctified, and praise God, I have been justified. Mm. Good stuff. And it's not because I preached it. It's because it's true. So my question is this. Do you know Jesus here today? Not have you been a good person. Not have you been in church. Not have you been memorizing scripture. Not have you been baptized. Not if you're a member of anything. Have you received Jesus into your life? My friends, we've been singing about that name all morning long. We sang it over and over and over. Jesus, Jesus. Have you received him? Have you traded places with Jesus? Has he become your sin and you become his righteousness that now you've been washed, you've been sanctified, now you've been justified? My friends, if not, listen to me. You need Jesus today and he is available to you right now. I don't care if you're here. I don't care if you're listening and watching on, on, on the live stream. You have an opportunity to receive Jesus right here today. Man, I, I, I've done the best I possibly can to bring you, as I've said before, bring you to the foot of the cross. Now it's up to you to receive Jesus. It's up to you. Would you call on his name? Last week I preached a message with you about having the one. Maybe you're not the one, but do you have a one? Did God lay somebody on your heart? Listen, I want to ask you, and you don't have to raise your hand. But I see this, and I'm done. When God laid that one on your heart, have you prayed for them this week? I hope you have. I, if you haven't, then I pray that he'll reestablish that person on your heart. And that today you'll remember, man, that person can be saved by the power of Jesus. And that person needs to be saved by the power of Jesus today. Would you pray for them and pray, God, 
bring someone into my path today. Bring someone into my path that I could live Jesus in front of them today. How bad would it be if we kept that to ourselves? My friend, listen to me. You have the answer to the ultimate disease, and that's the death of sin. You have the answer. I've said it before. How bad would it be if someone had a cure for cancer and they were hiding it right now? How bad would that be? Causing people that I love to go through things that should not have gone through. Causing me even to go through things that I shouldn't have had to go through. Because you had an answer. Well, I'm going to be pretty ticked off if you today say, Oh, well, preacher, I did have a cure for cancer. And a year ago, I could have given it to you and you'd have been fine. Ooh. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Amen. But listen, we got a cure for the worst thing out there. And that's the d- death of sin. Oh, and his name is Jesus. Would you give it to the people? Live it in front of them. Would you pray with me? Father, oh, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today thanking you, Lord, for your blessings. Thanking you for all that you've done for us. And God, I pray that there's someone here this morning that doesn't know you. Or Lord, I pray that there's someone here or someone watching this that realizes maybe today they have never come to know you as their Savior. Today, Lord, would you lead them? Would you call their name, Father? Let this be the day of salvation. And Father, I pray for those who this morning might know you. But Lord, that they, they've been a long time since they've remembered who they used to be. And today, Lord, you'd bring that to us. Father, help us see that here today. And Lord, maybe we are even living a life that's not pleasing to you. Lord, maybe we those characteristics that we talked about just in this text, Lord, maybe they need to be removed from us so that we could be truly identified with Jesus. Lord, let that be today. Let that be today. If you're here this morning or you're watching this, I want to encourage you today. Call upon the name of Jesus. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care where you've been. As we said, you're not too far that he can't reach down and and, and touch you. You're not so far away that he can't hear your cry for mercy. He'll do that today. Would you call on him? Christian, would you begin to pray for God to bring that someone into your heart that you could be living Jesus in front of them, intentionally bringing them to Jesus, that we could see souls being saved. Would you do that today? Oh, Father, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. We're going to enter. I'm Harold Gacious, pastor of First Baptist West. I want to thank you for watching our service today and hope that you were able to feel the God's Spirit moving as we were able to hear. And I want to always invite you to join us in person. If you're within driving distance, come and join us and we can worship together. But if not, continue to watch us in our live stream service as we will now, over the next few weeks, continue to be preaching on bringing people to Jesus. Our goal is is to make the church aware of the need that people have around us uh, for, for Jesus. And so that our hope is to bring people to that saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are needing anything that we can help you with, just please call us here at the church office, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to visit with you in any way that we can, help you in any way that we can. So we always want to welcome you and be, be a loving church. And remember, at First Baptist West, we're people that love God, love people, and we want to see lives changed.